All right, cool. So it's not a very exciting name because I haven't actually thought of a better name for it. But uh, so shared expenses. Um, basically, the idea was to share expenses in a sort of a smaller group uh, of people, like uh, with one other person or with uh, like maybe five other people, um, you know, like uh, maybe home expenses or heading up together on a holiday for a group of people or whatever it happens to be. Obviously, that, that second one's not going to happen anytime super soon. Uh, but, you know, kind of households and stuff is generally the kind of purpose of it. Um, and I was already using a, 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 an existing shared expense app called Settle Up, uh, which is actually really nice to work with. And they do have an API, but it was quite constrained. Um, and so I wanted to integrate the IPB stuff so that um, I could actually just have my transactions automatically go into it because uh, it wasn't really doing that and also sort of see which transactions I had recorded in the app and it was sort of becoming more and more complicated but the API is limited in that I couldn't actually get access to existing stuff that was inside there I could only add stuff and I wanted to be able to edit and sort of change things up so I decided I'll make an app that kind of somewhat copies a lot of the ideas uh, that they had because I thought they were really good um, but I, I'm trying to bring something different as well um, and then uh, the other main purpose was I wanted to learn Rails because I've been uh, I predominantly was on front end and I'm basically only working in Rails at the moment so I needed to skill up a lot um, and I haven't played with uh, Redux Toolkit and React uh, so I wanted to check out what that was like. Uh, so I've made a client and service side of things. Um, so it's quite a simple architecture. Uh, basically Investec authenticates with auth zero um, and then uh, it just sort of uh, fires off uh, any new transactions on the after transaction hook into Rails uh, and then the React front end uh, sits and looks at that stuff uh, and Rails is sitting with Active Record uh, using Postgres. Uh, I haven't used Active Record either. I'm one of the devs that offers in um, and we use Mongo uh, as our sort of database type layer. So um, it was interesting sort of changing that over. Um, yeah, so that was, that was kind of a, a fun change, useful sort of thing. Um, so challenges encountered over here was that, uh, yeah, like I said, I don't really know Rails and I haven't really used Active Record before. Um, I haven't used Redux Toolkit before, uh, so it took me a little while to get used to it, but then it's really, really quick to use and it's nice how, how much cleaner it makes everything. Um, and then I sort of was doing a kind of very basic JSON serialization of stuff uh, in Rails. Uh, and that was really, really limiting. I need to switch that out to like JSON API or GraphQL or something similar. Because it just became very, very clunky to try and retrieve data out of it. Uh, and then um, dealing with relational data within the selectors on the React side, um, getting like multiple sets of derived data was becoming very, very clunky. So I think sort of switching out uh, the APIs would probably be better. Um, so I see I've kind of skipped over one of the actual demo pieces. So I'm gonna, I'll show you the, the real demo now. Let's just move this out of the way. Uh, here we go. Okay, cool. So this is basically the app. So these are, um, I'm using seeded data for the moment, just because uh, I haven't hooked everything up fully. Um, I did have parts of it uh, running, but I've sort of switched that out for the moment. Uh, and also obviously I don't necessarily want to show all my actual transactions. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, these are all sort of like transactions that would be coming in from Investec. So they'd be sort of thrown into the app from the after transaction hook. And they're just sort of sitting over here. So this would just be the latest like 30 days or something. Um, and uh, you can have a look at any of these. Uh, so because it's seeded, obviously it's just got like sort of kind of somewhat nonsense sort of company names and things like that. So don't uh, look too strongly at those sort of things. But any one of these transactions, I can start adding to groups. So basically these transactions are sort of bare and they're not doing anything just yet. Um, but you can see a couple of them are tagged, like home, holiday. Uh, those are the only two groups I've got running. And what that means is I'm going to start kind of collating those expenses together. Um, and uh, I'll be able to sort of share them with somebody else. And I'll show you how that works in a moment. But basically, let me just take this first one. Um, and I'm going to assign it to the home group. Uh, and then give it a category. Um, and so I'm just going to pretend it's groceries. Uh, and I mean, I can change this if we want. Uh, so test demo, just so we can see it. Um, cool, now you can see that it's been assigned to a group over here. Um, I can edit this information again, but I'll just uh, jump ahead. 
Um, I can't change the amount because it's coming from an actual transaction. So that's pretty key. So I'm going to jump over to my groups and then we'll see it over there. Um, so uh, here we go. There's the, the groceries uh, sort of thing that I've just done. Uh, and you can see the related transaction that came from. Uh, and I can reassign it and sort of change groups and things. But for the moment, I'll just jump back. So you can kind of see all of these other expenses. And I've actually got somebody else in here as well. So there's uh, my girlfriend and I, we're in this group together. Uh, and all of our expenses are basically totaled up. And this is just in date order going up. Um, but essentially the purpose of this is to see who should pay for the next thing, right? So in the home expenses group, um, I've bought a whole lot of stuff. She's bought a whole lot of stuff, but I've actually 109 Rand down, right? So that's actually technically on negatives. Uh, so I should actually purchase the next thing, right? So uh, it's just a total of everything. And I'm, I'm 109 Rand under what she's paid. If I go have a look at another group, so there's a holiday group over here. Uh, in this case, I'm actually ahead and she owes uh, just under a grand um, in terms of settling up the amount uh, on this group. So she could just buy the next thing that we need to buy. Uh, so you can kind of see, like, uh, we can go over here. This is a sort of normal expense. It's basically a custom expense you can add. So the problem with just adding expenses from your real existing banking is only hooking it up to the after transaction hook means that only credit card expenses go through. And sometimes you do cash payments. Sometimes there are other types of expenses that happen that actually need to be assigned to like home or holidays or whatever kind of custom groups you have. So in order to kind of deal with that, and also uh, the fact that currently uh, my girlfriend doesn't actually have any uh, programmable banking is I've let her add her own uh, sort of custom expenses. Um, I just haven't hooked up that little piece yet. Uh, so to disable that because there was a bug. Uh, but over here, uh, if there are custom expenses, you can edit the values because obviously I don't have anything to relate it to transaction wise. So if she suddenly decides that this is gonna be uh, 2000 Rand um, and it says on the holiday group and we can change all of this, uh, maybe this is actually some takeout. Uh, so if I update that, um, there we go, 2,000 Rand takeout, obviously emergency shopping on that. And then it changes the totals of what's owed. So again, if we sort of switch that out, uh, make it uh, 3,000 one, you'll see the total sort of change around as well. Uh, and then we can reassign this and throw it into the home group and that'll kick it out of here. And we'll see it back over here, emergency shopping, this one. So, and then it sort of changes the expenses and costs on everything over here. So it basically just allows us to go and assign various expenses to whatever we're doing, generally home stuff, but if we're traveling around or going on any trips, we can kind of set that up as well. Um, you'll see that uh, with the sort of expenses that are tied to transactions, we just can't change things like amounts, but we can do everything else. Give it descriptions, um, do all of that sort of stuff. And you can kind of see those little descriptions and stuff uh, pop in. So yeah, that's the, the kind of the basics of it. Uh, let me switch over back to this thing. Uh, and yeah. Um, so be interesting to hear if anyone would find something like this sort of useful uh, and uh, any other kind of similar apps that were that were helpful that you think would be good ideas to take a look at for reference um yeah and then you can always just feel free to ping me on the office in community uh i'm at jethro with the uh, office in brackets and uh repo is coming soon i just need to tidy up a few things in it and make sure i don't have any accidental credentials and stuff stored but i'm pretty sure that's all good uh always fun to double check that sort of stuff yeah that's that's it uh oh yeah next steps uh so uh, I think hooking up something, uh, <laughs> obviously missed, <laughs> missed typing out the last bit of that slide. Uh, so changing to GraphQL um, and then hooking up like adding in uh, uh, of like custom expenses uh, where you can actually manually sort of set that stuff up and allowing people to create their own groups and stuff. At the moment, I'm sort of doing that stuff quite manually on the back end. Uh, so there's a bunch of pieces of the UI missing and the UX uh, needs to be refined a lot more. 
Um, and I'm probably going to drop the uh, th uh, sort of component pack that I'm using, which is ant D. Quite useful for sort of prototyping the ideas, but it's a bit limiting for mobile stuff, which is what I actually want to uh, go with. Yeah, so that's me. Cool, thanks. That looks, that's awesome. Really, really cool. Great idea. Um, different take on the idea as well, which is awesome. Nicely, well done. Um, so, thank you. I'll just maybe start off with some questions Wait. if there's nothing from the audience yet. Um, <laughs> what, what, what do you want to do with GraphQL specifically? Is there something? Uh, um, mostly, I just want to try it out because <laughs> we're actually, okay. um, it's something we're bringing in. Uh, on the other side, but the one of the main problems I had was uh, with serializing all of the stuff on Rails, it just became more and more clunky for me to do things and go like, hey, let me get all the related content. Uh, so basically, when I return everything, I'm returning an item plus it's like groups, it's categories, users, everything else as related IDs. And so I kind of have to collate all of that stuff and then go like, hey, wait, does a person need all of this stuff? You know, and so like, having to kind of fiddle with the endpoints to do that. I could, I could do it as JSON API, but I figured it was a good time to try do that kind of relational node jumping around with GraphQL. Also, I have very little understanding as to like the kinds of things GraphQL can do. So it seemed like worth investigating a bit and seeing if it would help in this case. Yeah. Cool. And if you had to do it all again, would you do anything differently? Um, so I, I actually kind of, like trying things that I, I don't know. I think there was a lot of learning that I did over here. Um, so I'd probably keep a lot of the things the same, but I, I probably would have started with JSON and API as, as the base level and then see if I need to like sort of change it up. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know uh, tremendously what, uh, what else I would do. I probably, the main thing I would have done is mocked up and sort of diagrammed a few of the things because uh, uh, I didn't, I kind of did it on the fly, sort of <laughs> code, on the, uh, code on the fly. Yeah. And uh, when things start getting complicated, it's really hard to kind of map out the problems. There's like the data layer on here is much more complex than I would have imagined it would get. And some of that is because I didn't sort of map it out. And obviously you add accidental complexity if you're not sort of thinking it all through. So probably a little more planning would be good. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, if someone like if someone else wanted to pick it up, what, what would you think they would do or what would you see them Sort of expanding on it uh yeah hopefully they could expand on it it's quite simplistic at the moment um the purpose is quite limited uh so it'd be nice to see if it could be if you could like have guests on groups um and share that a little bit more broadly and then maybe have like some sort of filtering or um graphing and things like that because uh, it's it, it sort of doesn't showcase a lot of stuff it's also not showing you kind of like within the last 30 days what is happened any recent changes um you know it's sort of it just considers everything as a very flat like all time which is not the most useful thing so it's it's got a lot of directions that can it can really go in um uh yeah i guess that's that's maybe it i'm not yeah sure i was thinking else, like uh, people would want some to do notifications I was thinking like notifications or like monthly reports of where you are yes yeah. That that was actually what that slide was meant to say. So it was. Uh, so I've I've signed up to One Signal, which is like a notifications uh, management yeah. uh, thing, like for um, push notifications. And the idea was like as soon as a transaction came in, you could just hit OK, add that to the app, and it would auto add it to like your favorite group, or you could pick a group from that notification, um, cool. and then just like pop it straight without having to open up the app. So that would yeah, be yeah, like cool. a big push. So not yeah, nice point. Cool. Okay, great. Thanks. Any questions from the audience? Anybody have a, something they want to chime in on? No. Cool. cool. Thanks. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, well, thanks so much. much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Well done. Uh, no, there's something there from Adam. Are you thinking about multiple yeah. groups? So it's designed with multiple groups in mind. Uh, basically, uh, it's a bit clunky to switch between the groups at the moment, but the idea is that each group has its own set of users. So you can say, have a group for kind of home life and have like just two people in, like I would do at the moment, but then like maybe you could have like digs mates or friends and have like multiple different groups with like different sets of users in there. Um, so yeah, that's, that's definitely one, one of the main purposes. I wanted to make sure that I could use that with friends as well. Sorry? Yeah, I think that was Arita. Yeah. 
I want to ask a quick question. Would you be able to have the different groups cancel each other out? So it's like, I have a group with my mom and then with my brother, but sometimes my brother owes my mom money and it would be great if it just canceled it all out and you only end up paying the one person. Huh. That's, no pressure, Jethro. <laughs> that would be tricky. I'd have to think out how to, how to map that out. <laughs> if you did like problem. a family with multiple groups and then it just canceled out. Okay, so it's like a, a one mega group over a series of groups. It could work that way. Mm. Yeah. Might be an interesting thing for your GraphQL. Yeah, yeah. You can yeah, build I think it out like, would, a, that like a tree. Well. Yeah. Splitwise cool. logic. Thanks. I'll have a look at that, Jan. That's, that's awesome. And then the yeah, other I, know, I, I mentioned it in the. Is, yeah. Yeah, I, I mentioned it in the, in the chat, but there's actually an app called Splitwise. Like you mentioned a different app, um, and yes. it does that. I, so um, I used Splitwise before, but I found it quite cumbersome and I had a lot of problems when I was sharing it against like sort of, I think about eight or nine people. And it just sort of, it was, it, it was really hard to get people like to work it, it, to get into the group. So there was like a lot of onboarding issues and I wanted to kind of remove that problem. Um, a lot of this was also like a learning exercise. So. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, yeah, I, I just, I thought the one you mentioned earlier was a different one. That's how it's It was, it. yes. Um, um, I used and it, they seem to have a pretty cool up. API. Okay. Okay. Yes. But the, the uh, thing I, I liked that. about Splitwise was that Splitwise, like you, they differentiate between an expense and a payment. So if you have a group mm. and lots of people, you know, pay for different things and everyone sort of owes into the pool different amounts, but then you can like, it'll tell you like, okay, you pay mm. this guy this much and he pays him and then everyone settles kind of thing. That's awesome. So what might be quite nice is actually sort of stripping out uh, the, the front end client and just integrating directly into Splitwise as an alternate approach. But I, well. I, I thought about that, but yours is quite useful to be able to kind of classify almost as like a, um, an inbox and you can go mm. in and say, yeah, put this in Splitwise, don't put this in. Use Splitwise is like your data layer. It's got groups yes. and it's got people. Um, that'd be, I mean, it's, a, it's an option. <laughs> yeah, no, that's pretty cool. I like that idea. Nice. Cool. Thanks. Nice. Cool. Great. Uh, if there's no other questions or comments, Ross. Uh, just up. a quick question on my side. Oh, cool. All right. Uh, so, Jethro, uh, I was just wondering, um, in terms of the setup, um, is it always just even distribution? Like you're saying, you have the one with you and your girlfriend. Is it always just like a 50 50? And if there's three people, it's 33.33% across the board or do you have or are you thinking of a way of kind of structuring it so it's like um, you can set the percentage or the offset between the members of the group so it's like uh, those who are rich are paying 50 and others are paying 25 25 or something <laughs> like that <laughs> Um, yeah, so actually, uh, the app that I was referencing, uh, did kind of a weighting of payments or a value set on payments. So you could either say, you know, 500 Rand of this payment or 33% of it or whatever. Um, and I built that in initially, and then I realized I was just adding so much complexity up front. So I stripped it out, uh, cause I noticed that at least with our own habits, we're splitting directly down the middle. So it didn't make a lot of sense uh, just for now to do that, but I think that would be a, a useful addition and I can see a lot of use cases for that. So yeah, that definitely would be something worth adding. Okay, cool, perfect. Yeah, I said, yeah. Cool. Uh, if there's no one else, then we're gonna move on to Ross. Awesome. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, my one's uh, quite simple. Um, so I'm a DevOps engineer, so I work in the terminal quite a bit. Um, so having to log in and use the phone and do the two-factor auth the whole time can sometimes get like a bit tedious. Uh, so I thought, what's an easy way for me to view uh, my data that I have? So if can everyone see my screen? Yeah. So what I built uh, was a little Investec um, CLI tool. Um, and if we have a look at it, you'll just see, also I was just trying out new uh, packages that I found. Uh, it was actually very quick to build this out. I did it last night. I didn't think it would be that quick, but I was actually quite surprised. Uh, but you have your investec and you have your different um, commands. So we have like our accounts, the balance, uh, we can log in and our transactions. And then these are just like the properties that we have set. Um, so there's a, if I just do this quickly, I'm not gonna open up the file, um, but we have an invest XL line and inside there, there's a credentials um, file, which is just JSON, which is pretty much has um, your client ID, your secret. 
and then we write the token and token type that we get back from the OAuth process. Um, so just to show how it works, if we do invest XLI, we'll first um, log in and then we'll be able to invest XLI accounts. And then this will actually just display some of my different accounts that I have on there. Uh, there's still a few things I want to do, like I don't want to have to enter the account ID to see the balances and stuff. Um, so there's more work that really does need to be done, but this is just like a quick prototype, I suppose. So the next thing that we could do is we could do invest XCLI um, balances and then give it the, no, no. I'm not even getting my own one right. Um, I think just balance. Yeah. And there we can see. So this is the balance in my account currently, what the available balance is and the currencies. Um, I want to also add on like further on is that do you, if you can enter the um, currency that you'd like to see. So for example, if you want to convert to US or, or pounds, for example. And then the other thing that we can also do with it is just see the transactions um, that are linked to the Pacific account. So you can just see. So just a quick way to see what's happening on the account through the CLI um, without having to go into the web client each time. So yeah, very simple. Um, I don't mind taking people through the code. It's just a very simple. Um, and the tools that were used. I just want to make sure I didn't miss out anything. No, cool. Um, so it's a, you do a class, uh, very simple. You have your init, you have your credentials path that can be overwritten. Um, this can also be overwritten via the CLI, um, and this will go set a whole bunch of things. We then have the login method, which will do our OAuth and get the token back from us. We store that um, into the properties, and then we also just write that back to the file. This is a very quick and dirty method of doing it. Um, and then we've got the accounts method, um, which is literally, we just call the API endpoint. We get that data back. like writes out those graphs for you and you can configure it in multiple different ways, have different headers, um, give it different data structures. And then it's pretty much a repeat all the way down for your balance and your transactions um, as well. And then just to show the two packages. So this is um, a Python package called Python Tablet. Uh, it's quite nifty, very quick to use and easy to pick up. Um, and then I used Google um, Python Fire for the CLI. Um, and yeah, it's super easy actually just to get it like working. So what you do is in my initiation class, um, you literally just call Fire Fire over your um, class. And it pretty much writes out the whole CLI tool for you for your accounts and does the uh, documentation and the help menu and all of that. And yeah, that was pretty much, pretty much what I did. Cool, nice and cool. It's very, very impressive that you did it so so quickly. I guess finding the right packages is uh, is useful. Um, so, is there anything like surprising that you learned, like something that you? Um, well, actually, actually to learn, at, at first I thought it would be uh, quite tedious to do it, honestly, because you already have so much of like the tools available to you to view that information. Um, but actually, once I started doing it already today. I was like playing around with those and I thought, yeah, I spent so much time in the CLI. It was actually quite cool. And I was thinking of how can you expand it further? So I want to be able to put in like, I want 90 days of my transactions back. Um, how can you get that sort of information? I want to have like, can you tell me how much money I've spent between this and this time? Um, I'll just to try that. I really want to try to find a graph that you can, or a library that can do graphing on the CLI. Um, and possibly That's like cool. graph how you spend over like a month and have that running and see if I can flatten the curve. Um, <laughs> and you know, no, it, it was fun. Um, I quite enjoyed it. It would be, and it was nice playing with open API. I think I'm going to add a few uh, roadmap items onto the project as well for other things that you could get, which I think would be quite cool. Uh, but yeah, I won't delve too deep into that at the moment, but yeah, no, it was fun. It was good just to play around with. That's awesome. Yeah. Looks like it was, it was quite a cool little, little thing that you managed to put together. Um, what, do you see other people picking it up and extending it? And what, in what ways would you see them sort of building on it or extending it, taking it in a different direction maybe? Uh, 
Sure. No, actually, I've got no idea. I mean, anyone, I haven't put the reef up yet either. Um, I still need to do all of that. So I will share that. But I mean, anyone's welcome to grab it and extend it and see what they want to do. Um, I was thinking maybe trying to put like a Dynamo DB or maybe even put all of this into Lambdas and then just have a CLI that's the interface to like API Gateway with Lambda because it'll just be better for storing all the secrets and handling that information. Um, but yeah, I think that would be like the next step if I had to build on it more was like how could you actually put this in AWS with serverless and explore that side better and possibly play around with the new, what not RDS, but they got the one that new serverless RDS database, maybe play around with that or Dynamo DB and see which one would work better. Yeah, and then actually full stats and do more analytics. Cool, awesome. That's, yeah, really cool. Uh, any, any questions from the audience? I, I have two questions, one for us and one possibly for the investing team if they're online, because it, it relates to what Ross has done. So Ross, I mean, um, do you have to, I mean, I don't know if, um, for example, do you do or maybe auto login perhaps as an idea instead of having to physically log in or type in the login command before typing in accounts, for example, is that something you can maybe look at so that it's more co so convenient to use instead of having to first invest the CLI login and then continue on with everything else? Yeah, I was I was actually thinking about doing that was just putting it straight into the initializer and just saying like log in every time. Um, sort of like a refresh token, I suppose you could do that in a sense with the OAuth. Um, but I quite like the approach of actually having to do the login myself because if, if anybody else has to get onto my computer and they have to figure out the CLI tool, it means they have full access. Uh, but I suppose they could also just do the login command and get full access at the same time. Um, so no, I haven't really thought about it that much, um, but I, I do like the approach. I would be nice if you could have like a proper refresh token, I suppose, but you could check against open API or mm. build that in yourself. Um, but yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> My other question is for like, let's say for example, you did put this on some serverless architecture, something like that. Right. And this is probably where it would be interesting because we don't want to copy what you did. We just want to use what you have. So it's almost like sure. there must be a way that we can, that I can use your, use your code, but not having to copy it in a sense that without sharing my credentials with you. And that's maybe something that we need to look at because there's a lot of cool stuff that's going on, but I have to copy the code literally and run it on my own versus if, so basically everyone has to run your code on their own in order for us to be able to use it. And that's probably not ideal. So I don't know, maybe if the investor guys can think of a way that we can somehow share the details but or, or give Ross's program a token or something like that uh, that that he can use to get the information from our from my from my API, from my transactions without me giving him my, my keys you know there, there's something that we need to do there maybe perhaps yeah um, so I mm, yeah so I think the, yeah that's a valid valid concern obviously uh, I'll have to get try and get my head around that so I'm busy with another integration at the moment. So it would actually mean that this is just kind of a third party integration, right? Yeah. Uh, um, and like, fair enough, you don't want to share your, your, your secret. However, uh, we are like as part of one of our other integration projects, we, we are actually in the process of implementing, um, like direct direct uh, indication, well direct authorization in in which case you actually generate an API key through Investor Online that you can then use on a third party application. But I don't want to get your hopes up there because, uh, and that maybe ties in with uh, Vahid's question as well. Like the problem that we've got is, uh, and I think like the the usual crowd would have heard me telling you this probably like every week, but there, there are quite a few new people on the group. The problem is that uh, on the SA side, we don't have a regulator, not a banking regulator, but a regulator in the sense of open banking. Like in the UK, we, we pretty much have um, the, an, a, a regulator that, that um, vets all these third party consumers. So if a third party uh, is a open banking, uh, shall I say, um, regulated entity and have been approved by them, then in turn, then we automatically trust them and we allow them into our world. 
uh, on the SA side is very much self-regulated, right? So fair enough, we cannot prevent you from going and like pasting your OAuth credits in all kind of dodgy apps. Like that's up to you. Like that's the risk that you take. Uh, there's not a th concrete third party integration flow that we support at this stage. That then ties into stuff like payments uh, and transfers. Like I think transfers are probably uh, much less of a risk. So that could potentially, um, I don't know, come like come into light like at some stage. There's nothing that I can confirm or promise you at this stage because there's a lot of security um, considerations at play here. And at the end of the day, like <laughs> technically everything is possible, but we still have to look after you and your money. Like that's our primary um, priority here. So um, yeah, I know it's very vague. It, it definitely doesn't answer your question, but I, I hope it does create you some context around like why it is very limited at this point in time because we are still like trading through all those various scenarios and like at the end of the day uh i guess you would trust us to provide you with something that's rock solid and secure hmm. uh, i mean that I mean, is our work, primary like purpose yeah, and priority yeah. it can work like many other third party integrations when i connect my github account to heroku or when i connect my github yeah. account to travis ci or something like that yeah. so i log into it i go from 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 this third party website or tool go to investec investec auth and investec can tell me give them access yeah. to a b c d and f and and hit I need grant yeah. access, and then at some yeah. point in inside Investec, I can go and see everything that has access, and I can revoke, revoke, revoke. So if it's something yeah. as something like that, then I think we we're good to go. That's all we need. So what you are referring to is in essence uh, three-legged old flow, and that is what we uh, have provided in the context of our UK open banking, uh, shall I say, offering. Uh, but you can imagine that. Um, like it is a very bes like in our world it's quite actually quite a quite a bespoke uh uh implementation uh there's kind of all kinds of uh things that play like consents and the rest so we're not gonna necessarily go down the route of building three-legged old flows facilitating the world um and that's where we are toiling with the idea of direct authentication, where you basically generate an API key from within your Investec online, and you provide the consent there and then in the context of your, your private bank profile and accounts and permissions. And then that will allow you to basically uh, facilitate integration into the bank. However, like at the end of the day, all those third parties that you are referring to will have to be onboarded onto our open API platform. Now that is where the UK open banking one is very uh, say easy because again, like if the open banking uh, implementation entity trusts you, we inherently trust you. But on the SA side, we don't have mm -hmm. those of uh, regulating bodies that will, that will assist us in that regard. So it's a, it's a bit of a difficult one at this stage, to be honest. Cool. Uh, I think we, we got something. Sorry. Yeah, I think we got some, some chatter going on around that. Quite a few comments in the chat. I'll try and summarize them and maybe send them out um, in the Slack and, and over to you guys, um, Willem. Um, before we move on to Investec update, uh, we had a new, new person who missed introducing themselves. Wilhelm Erasmus, do you want to quickly do your intro? And then we'll move on to Investec update. Hi guys, yeah, I'm Phil Helm. Uh, I joined the open banking, not open banking, but the programmable banking beta today. Um, and yeah, I've been pretty impressed. I've already set up uh, uh, one, one check. Essentially, I've integrated the Investec flow with my home assistant flow. So it will check if I'm home or not before allowing a payment through. But yeah, I'm just wondering if there's at the moment um, any any way to actually check 
if a payment was executed using what method? So if it was driven pin transaction or a contact transaction or a online transaction, that would be great if that does exist. Mm, to my knowledge, we don't have that context. So we don't actually provide you that distinction. Uh, it's very much like all, uh, if, you, if you, are you referring to the OPI transaction endpoint or actual um, events within programmable cards? At the moment I'm talking about programmable cards specifically. And I mean, there's one field coming back that says type, but it seems to say card for pretty much everything there. Yeah. It is because um, those hooks are literally only firing off um, when a card transaction happens. It's only, currently only our card system is integrated with root programmable banking. Uh, through the open API, however, you will get all black like, transactions that occur on that account. That makes sense, but I'm saying it would be great if we could have a way to identify what what method was used to actually make the card transaction? Like, was online? Was it, you know, chip and pin? Was it contactless? Stripe? Or, you know, what actual okay, method was used by, by the things? Okay. Uh, okay, cool. I'll take that back to the team and try and get you an answer on that. Thank you. I cool. appreciate it. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. So, I think on that note, we can swing into Investec update. Yeah, okay, cool. So from, a, from an open API uh, perspective, at least, um, uh, we still like in the process of updating the documentation, uh, but uh, date, uh, date range filtering has been implemented on the transactions endpoint. Uh, so essentially you would be able to, uh, through query parameters, uh, specify a, a from date in the ISO 8601 format uh, and or a to date uh, in the event that a from date uh, wasn't specified uh, the default will will remain and that is basically today minus 180 days uh, and obviously again if the to date wasn't specified um, obviously today's date will be uh, utilized or applied uh, and then also uh, you will notice in the response payload of the transactions endpoint uh, the transaction date will also be included. Okay, so there's obviously, uh, we are still working on trying to get you some form of transactional ID that is that is in on the backlog. Um, we are busy with that. From a, from a reprogrammable card perspective, um, yeah, we've been, we've been doing quite a few things um, that that's not, that's basically non-functional. We like moving our our APIs into our Kubernetes environment. Um, we, I don't know, I'm not too sure if the, no, we are actually in the process of migrating the, the lambdas into the AWS uh, SA data center. So those are, those are the things that we are busy with. Uh, we are moving into our regular month in change freeze. Um, well, today was the last deployment date. Um, and so the plan is, is to, after our uh, month in change freeze, uh, to actually release the um, feature that will allow you to save code without publishing it to your card. So it's creating that abstract abstraction layer between persisted code and published code. Um, other than that, uh, I, can, I can share some of the things that we are busy with. Uh, I shared it last week as well is essentially helping you to create a credential store where, so the, the big issue here is currently when you create your open API credentials, it's very much in the context of your default uh, private bank profile. And it will basically, when you um, consume the accounts endpoint, it will basically return all the accounts in that profile. Um, so what the credential store will allow you to do is, is actually select a different uh, profile or any of, of your uh, Investec private bank profiles, as well as um, select specific accounts. And, you, and um, like through that, you will be able to create various sets of credentials um, as well. So that, those are the things that we are also uh, busy with from a development point of view.
Any questions? Uh, what's the motivation? For yeah. Uh, okay, so again, the thing is, is um, the three-legged OAuth flow, um, so essentially you are providing a third-party consumer access to your accounts, transactions, and balances, right? Um, now, that third party will absolutely have to be onboarded onto our open API platform. Okay, so that, that is the one of, one of the key uh, requirements there. Um, so in, in essence, like we cannot allow a third party through the three-legged OAuth into our world if they themselves haven't been onboarded onto our open API platform. It makes it different with uh, the open banking, um, the UK open banking implementation, it's again, the, those third parties are trusted by the open banking implementation entity. So there's a different trust layer there through open ID, connect and the rest. Like what we provided you is a very, very basic uh, OAuth integration layer with just like client ID and secret. Uh, with three-legged OAuth, proper three-legged OAuth, you would generally want to have OIDC and the rest. Now that brings again certificates. It brings with it quite a quite a bunch of complexities. Um, so you would imagine that um, we will have to go through that process with every single third party that could potentially integrate with us. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's, there's not a. There, sorry, I asked the question. Uh, there's not a national sort of directory of. Uh, yeah. PISPs or third parties. So, 100%. Um, it, but but that doesn't really stop Investec maintaining their own registry, right? Or or being the being the pioneers and uh, getting the other banks to follow. Um, so I agree with you. There's a there's a bunch of extra complexity, but but uh, I think like for most people, that's the real like innovation tipping point is when you can get third party apps controlled access to yeah. your account. Yeah. If, if so, my, mm. Sorry, but my jump in, I've uh, had discussions with banks here from this, uh, and in terms of the uh, fee requirements and the penalties as per our um, banking acts, um, the problem is that the banks don't want to release the penalties down, or they can't uh, dis uh, distinguish themselves from the penalties, uh, and that makes it difficult for them to have a third party or a single entity as an auth party. I know mm. that there are um, guys like One Direct, or, or, no, sorry, One Direct, uh, One Identity, uh, that's building a, a identity management vault uh, where people can subscribe to, uh, and also I know Direct Transact is also subscribing to that specific vault. Right, and, and and I mean the tipping point in the U.S. or in other places, and a lot of what prompted PSD two was there's people just doing it through screen scraping already, right? Mm. If, if you don't get given APIs, um, then then guys find a way around it. That's definitely less secure than a proper OAuth mm. framework for delegated access. No, uh, the, for sure. the South African banks are fully aware of PSD2, uh, but they, tr they they choose to ignore it. Yeah, it's, it's a disintermediating <laughs> force, right? Um, <laughs> you need a bank that wants to work with partners <laughs> and not do everything themselves. Sorry, I don't yeah. want to knock banks. I, I do consult into banks uh, on core banking solutions. So I, do, <laughs> I just unfortunately happen to know the, the, the attitude in, within banks. Yeah, so um, I saw a question from Adam regarding uh, will we at any point be able to upload code to our programmable card via the open API? Now, one of our colleagues, uh, Shaul, he actually did a demo on this quite a few weeks, if not months ago, before the open API was even live. But that, that would have uh, required you to actually enter your um, like investor credentials, which is a very big no-no. Um, so I guess now that we do have the open API, uh, I think it, it becomes more, more uh, realistic uh, because it uh, because it is at the end of the day a like semi proxy type of thing. So um, that is something that's very much still on our backlog. It hasn't been prioritized, obviously. Um, but yeah, I think it is possible. Shaw has proven the concept 
it's definitely possible. And uh, I think at some stage it will hopefully make it onto the priority list. It makes cool. sense. Like then you can use your own ID, you can use your own sort, uh, you know, version control, all of that. Like it yeah. just yeah. open so many doors. Uh, yeah, your so own IDs and whatever. Yeah, one hundred percent. Cool. Um, we had a question in the Slack from Peter. I think his name is. Um, he couldn't join today. Um, he was stuck without his wallet. He couldn't pay for something. So he was starting to wonder mm -hmm. about having phone tap or phone to scan type payments, something similar to like a WeChat. Um, so you described sort of the industry in China, how he could essentially do everything he needed to do without having a wallet or his card with him. All he needed was, mm -hmm. was WeChat or, or Alipay or, or something like that. And what Investex plans are in that line. I'm not sure if you can comment on it, but I thought I'd, I'd at least raise it here to see yeah, there's nothing that I'm aware of at the moment, to be honest. Um, yeah. Okay. Maybe nothing it'll just uh, spark some conversations from you into, yeah. into the broader teams in, in Investec. Um, and we'll put it on someone's, someone's radar. Um, yeah, Willem, he, he, he's got a, a Xiaomi phone that didn't have Google Pay on it or, or something like that. So he was kind of looking for a native, a native solution instead of uh, one of the third parties like a Samsung Pay or, or anything like that. But yeah, so if, there's, if, there, if there aren't any other questions from the audience or anybody- I have, a, I have a sort of non-specific question if you don't mind. It's, it's yeah, for sure, go the, for it, go for it. Team. Yeah, we've so got a little bit I was of just out of interest. So there was a question around like, uh, or a feature request around transaction context. Um, so I was just kind of wondering how much you can share about where the programmable banking hooks are triggered in your auth pipeline. Like, do you have access oh, to yeah. the full ISO 8583 message? Um, okay. So basically where it, where it, where it triggered is basically in parallel with the normal, um, so let's say our our like validation process or whatever. So it's just another layer of validation. Before so, the card system, then, after the card yeah, system. Yeah, in our card card okay. system. Yeah. Okay. So basically, um, like it's basically doing the the fraud checks, is doing balance checks and the rest. This is another check that 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 gets executed, um, and then basically our uh, card system will then either then reject or allow that transaction. So okay. it's just another check that sits on top. And that's where it's, uh, for everybody that's not aware, there is a, a two second timeout on that. Yeah. So our card system will actually wait for a maximum of two seconds to get an answer from the programmable card engine. And if not, it will just carry on with life as per normal. Cool. And that is basically what happens if you on Investec on the on Investec on um, app or on Investec online. If you toggle that uh, that 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 cause functionality, it will actually just like if it's disabled, it will just sidestep that execution. Okay. Yeah. So so I mean, you guys are obviously proxying. You you're exposing a certain amount of the auth message to the engine. Um, do you know what the raw what the raw auth message is? Is it a just straight off the card network? Um, because I, I'm I'm thinking about like the request around you know acceptance context. Um, could you know and and what makes sense as a feature request and what's actually available? I mean, obviously mm. you have to sort of expose it safely in probably a more developer consumable format than the I think it's like binary flags and stuff which are not very useful. Mm. Mm. Um, I can try and get context of that for you. Cool. Uh, I don't have it specifically. My focus is more on the API kind of things. So Shaul and Aaron's, they are more of the, the root programmable code. Cool, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll pick it up through the Slack. That sounds, it's a, it's not okay. A, yeah, that would be perfect. Query, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that would be perfect. Cool. And at least we can track it. Perfect. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. This I'll has been awesome. The links. I'll find the links to the, yeah. logging requests and logging tickets or, and repost it. Yeah, in the I think so uh, yeah, that's maybe also something up. for the new guys. Uh, yeah, we'll, still around here. 
is like um, any comments, any suggestions, any like anything, like post it on a Slack channel or on the, the, the GitLab instance, it, it is integrated with our uh, logging system and the rest. And that will allow us to then either like get it onto the backlog or um, and like look at it and like track it properly. Awesome. Good, thanks. Great. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone, for joining and participating. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Thanks for hosting, Alex. I, yeah, Thanks for hosting. that's good. I hope it was, I hope it was good. Uh, I hope I made yeah, a good, good ben, ben, ben substitute. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Have, Have a good, a good evening. Uh, weekend. Yeah, and a good weekend. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Ciao. Yeah. Bye. Yes. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.